אהלן, ערב טוב. שלום, שבת. איט, שבת שלום. סבתא, פשוט צריכה להכיר אותה. אני הכרתי מספיק חברות שלה. שושי! שירה? לא יודעת. זה מריה, מי פיאנסייס. Nothing can top my favorite Israeli German die couple. I give it two months. My girls! Well, you can always convert, you know? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't tell our families yet? Ah, oh, we get the brand new ring! We get the brand new ring! Yeah! I think they've noticed the ring. Yeah. Are you Maria's parents? Who's asking? The Mossad. Oh. No, 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 it's a joke. <laughs> ברשת. It's like I'm living in a minefield, just waiting to explode right in my face. BOM! That's what happens to the people in Israel. Can we at least try to get through one Shabbat dinner without fighting over politics? I don't think so. I'm not telling you to convert, but if you want to have kids... You need to keep your religion out of our reproductive systems. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sandra Brett. I am the director of the Charleston Jewish Film Festival, and this is Sonny Neighbor, the Savannah Jewish Federation Community Impact Coordinator. Want to say hi, Sonny, to everybody? And uh, Sonny and I warmly welcome you to tonight's program. I hope that you will join us for our remaining programs in this virtual spring 2021 series. Details are on the Charleston Jewish Film Fest Facebook page, and you can always email Sonny or me, and our email addresses will be in the chat shortly. This year, our virtual film festival is a joint effort between Charleston and Savannah. In Charleston, we're under the umbrella of the College of Charleston Yaschik Arnold Jewish Studies Program with funding with generous funding from the Charleston JCC Foundation and in Savannah, Savannah's Friends of the Festival. Many, many thanks to all of our sponsors and donors without which this festival could not be uh, possible. And many thanks to all of you for participating in tonight's film discussion featuring Kiss Me Kosher. We have a very special program tonight. We'll begin with some thoughts on the movie by Aniv Sagi, who woke up literally at 2 a.m. from Israel to be with us here followed by a pre-recorded interview with a producer of Kiss Me Kosher, Christine Gunter, who is in Berlin. And finally, the best part of any virtual program, your comments and questions for Yaniv, as well as your thoughts about the movie. So please put your questions at any time in the chat, which is in the bottom part of the screen, or raise your hand and we'll call on you and we'll ask your question. We'll ask you to ask your question to Yaniv. So now I'm very honored to introduce Yaniv Sagi, the CEO of Givat Haviva from Israel. Under Yaniv's leadership since 2012, Givat Haviva has become a recognized groundbreaker in the field of shared society between Jews and Arabs in Israel with over 50,000 participants in the 36 programs. Yaniv's preparation for his role as CEO includes working cooperatively, cooperatively with ministers of education, Neset members, mayors, and regional council members, as well as Arab municipal leaders. Bat Haviva received the UNESCO Prize for Peace Education for its longstanding work in promoting Jewish-Arab dialogue and reconciliation, and has been granted special consultative status to the UN Economic and Social Council. So first, Yaniv, we can't thank you enough for waking up to be with us here. Obviously, your position and your experience will really help us appreciate the movie. And uh, Yaniv, can we ask you to please share your insight into Israeli society and diversity through your work at Givat Haviva, especially as it relates to Kiss Me Kosher. Yaniv? Good evening, everybody. Um, you see, it's, it, might, it might be 2 a.m. in the morning, but I'm here in this 
sunny, flowery forest in Givat Chaviva. Well, actually, I took the pictures several days ago, but still, this is the way it looks now. On my back, those are the, the red flowers are called Kalaniot in Hebrew, and the white ones are called Rakafot. And um, this is beginning of spring over here. So I want to connect myself to the movie uh, and give you a bit of a background of who I am and why am I doing what I'm doing while highlighting three major aspects of the movie connected to the three generations that were seen in the movie. Um, I'll start by a, a small story. About five years ago, Givat Chaviva was granted a reward from a German foundation, which is called the Ebert Foundation. It's a big foundation, and we were asked to come to Berlin uh, in order to participate in the reward, and I was granted the honor to have the keynote speaking um, opportunity. They also asked me if I am recommending any Israeli artist that will bring in the, uh, the music to the event. So I recommended an Israeli Arab woman. Her name is Maria Tokan. She's from Haifa. She's actually a lawyer, but an amazing singer. And, and we came to Berlin. And when I started my talk there, I said the following. I am a second generation of a Holocaust survivor. My father would not step his feet on the German land. He totally resisted ever going into Germany or connecting to any German people. And here I am, only one generation afterwards, receiving an award from the German federal country for the work that I and my organization are doing in order to bring peace into Israel and in order to connect between Jews and Arabs living in Israel, uh, what will make our democracy possible. When I was 15, by then I already knew that my father was a Holocaust survivor, but he never told me his story. He was not willing to pass his story to the next generation, afraid that it might carry on to more generations, and he wanted to stop everything on him. And although he wasn't telling me his story from the Holocaust, he did take me right next to my kibbutz to a place where it was almost an empty field. And while we were there, he said, look around, can you see anything? And I saw a remaining of some ruined home. And I asked him, yeah, there's, there's a home that used to be here. What was it? I said, well, prior to the kibbutz, right around this area, there used to be seven Palestinian villages. And in this place, there was the village of Kafrein, and it was ruined. And actually, I came to Israel speaking about himself. In 1948, exactly three months after the people that lived here had left their home. I'm a Holocaust survivor, and I finally had liberty and freedom and a home when the Jewish people created a nation. But at the same time, the Palestinians that lived here had needed to flee from their home and escape, and they lost their liberty and freedom. And one cannot solve a problem of one nation by creating a problem for another nation. And you cannot solve one suffering by creating suffering for others. So as 15 year old child, I was given the most important lesson of my life, which is we the Jewish people need a home for the continuation of the Jewish peoplehood. But we need to find a way to make it a share home with the Arab citizens of this country. And we need to find a way to have peace and justice with our Palestinian neighbors. Only three years later, he told me his story in the concentration camps 
of Transnistria, where he lost his father, um, he lost his grandmother, and hardly made it through the war. When I watched the movie, I saw three different stories in three generations. The grandmother was a Holocaust survivor, connecting to her Arab neighbor and lover is a big story about partnerships and connections between Jews and Arabs living in Israel today. The second generation was the American Ole Hadash, who was this right-wing settler living together with a left-wing uh, uh, second generation of the Holocaust uh, in the, ter the occupied territories or big Israel and trying to make it out, becoming a family that is connected with this big split in their politics. And the third generation of two women, a lesbian couple, one gender, between a third generation of a Holocaust survivor and a young German um, woman. All of this complexity is very much alive and kicking in Israel, our days. We are trying to sustain a democracy with huge political split that brings us to the fourth election in just a month from, less than a month from today. We are trying to find a way to live with our Arab minority while we have a nation state law just two years ago that de facto and the UA becomes a positioning of a second class citizens. And we are trying to find a way to live between the three, four, five generations of nowadays Israel, where young Israelis are shifting away from the uniqueness of the country, trying to find their natural places outside of Israel or inside of Israel, but not too much akin with their Jewish background. From my end, there is a huge task for us in order to sustain Israel, is how to make sure that the Jewish people have a homeland, that we do have a national home, but at the same time that Israel is a real democracy where all citizens enjoy equal citizenship in, a, in an egalitarian country. And this is what I've been doing for many, many years. I'm a member of a kibbutz movement that believes at the same time in Zionism and in the shared society for Jews and Arabs. And I will finish my introduction by saying that I'm looking forward to your questions in order to go a bit more deep into what the movie shows in terms of the Israeli complexity. But I'm already saying that not only that I found a lot of humor in the movie, but I saw that in many ways, all figures that are in the movie are people for me that I am really connected to in many ways. And I could see my friends and partners and people that I share this country with in that movie. So as an introduction, that's my time. And I'm looking forward to the next phase in this discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you, Yaniv. Um, so now we are going to go to a short interview that I did during the week with Christine Gunter, who is the producer of Kiss Me Kosher. She will give us a little bit of insight into why she made the movie. And I think with her remarks and Yaniv's remarks, uh, we'll really get a nice feel of the message behind the movie and why it was made the way it was. So get your questions in the chat and we will entertain them after the following short interview with Christine. Hi everybody, this is Sandra Brett. I am the director of the Charleston Jewish Film Fest and I am thrilled to have with me today, Christine Gunther, Gunther, who is the producer of Kiss Me Kosher, which we have all watched and loved. 
She's the co-founder of Fire Glory Pictures, which specializes in international productions with crossover storytelling that bridges the Atlantic and sparks flames in minds and hearts. So I do want to just wave to everybody, Christine, before Hi. we start. Thanks but for thanks, having us. Thanks so much for being here and give us a little bit insight into how this movie got made. And I guess the first thing that I'd like to ask you is how you found the story. Well, the story found me. Um, I can't take credit for finding it. Uh, Shirelle and I, we've been introduced to each other by um, uh, shared friends in, in Tel Aviv. Um, we met actually in Berlin um, in a beer garden on a spring day and Shirelle pitched me the story. Um, and I was on fire for it because I thought, oh, this is great. This is a romantic comedy, but it has all those ingredients that add some extra sparks to it. Um, for once, um, it is a representation for um, a, a, queer, a queer couple, um, but the, uh, the queerness of the couple is not... Um, it's not the problem here. So it's not a coming, of, uh, coming out uh, story. It is a story of clashing families and cultures and also clashing uh, personal um, um, plans how to, how to conduct this relationship. So um, that's, uh, that's what I navigated towards to. This is why, uh, this is why I thought it's worthwhile making to just add some some layers and perspective um, uh, and diversiveness, a uh, diversity to uh, the genre of the romantic comedy and the romantic culture clash comedy. So um, yes, I think that was about seven years ago, if I'm right, mm -hmm. that uh, Shirei pitched the first idea and then we started to co-develop and um, um, a, a few incarnations of the script uh, followed and uh, 2019 we actually went into production in Israel. So can you talk about some of those challenges in the seven years? Um, well, I mean, I think um, an independent film is always a challenge, probably also the non-independent films are always challenges, film is always a challenge um, and financing films as a challenge, especially in the current climate, uh, also pre-COVID, of course. Um, and it just took a while to get um, the money together. That was the biggest challenge. We, we, um, we knew we had an, an amazing script, uh, the feedback we've received by um, the partners who went first in and then all the others was um, uh, very excited. Um, so we believed in the project and um, finally we, we, um, we got it on screen. So yeah, and um, other challenges um, were shooting, shooting um, uh, with a, a very international crew. So many different um, cultures and also filmmaking processes or traditions came together. We had a mix of um, Israeli, German, um, American crew. Uh, which was uh, exciting, but also added to the whole balagan of um, of getting getting it done and and still loving each other in the process, which <laughs> is uh, which is probably a good reflection of of the film itself. It sounds like it was a lot of fun. Can you just give us a couple of particularly fun moments that you had when you were make, making the film? Yeah, we had, it's actually not in the, in the final cut, but we had this gigantic cross. Our, our band was carrying a cross to the, uh, through the old city of Jerusalem while, um, uh, while singing another incarnation of the um, Hatuna song and um, shooting, uh, um, shooting um, uh, Sivan Talmor in a wedding dress uh, with two uh, other singers carrying a huge cross through the old <laughs> city of Jerusalem uh, was a challenge. So we had all the attention, the unwanted one, of course, also. And um, yeah, we, we just uh, had to make sure that we're uh, quick in and quick out. And um, also in the in the in the soundscape of Israel to to shoot anything that um, can make it um, uh, on screen later in terms of original sound, 
was definitely challenging. We had this, um, the Jewish princess bar. Uh, we, we wanted to shoot in this location. And when we scouted it, um, it seemed sound safe and sound proof. So um, we all greenlit the location and were excited that we had the perfect Jewish princess bar. But then in the end, um, when we started to shoot there, we realized that there is like um, an illegal kindergarten um, next door, but for like toddlers and probably 50 of them. And um, there was just no way to get anything done in terms of um, sound quality. So those were the challenges and the surprises. Um, yeah. So you to, clearly yeah. navigated them for the final product. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Um, and can you just tell us some of the reaction to the film? Has it been different in different countries in any way? Um, positive, I, more positive, negative? We, throughout the, we're so privileged and so lucky because wherever it, it meets audiences, we, we get amazing feedback. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what we get so far and we hope to that this continues. So no, I mean, of course, um, uh, Germany and Israel um, have have um, skin in the game uh, in terms of, of, of course, uh, cultural and in historic um, uh, baggage and, and humor is a different thing in, in, in both countries and culture, I think. Um, Shirel navigated that um, I believe very elegantly. And um, it is something that whenever German audiences um, meet stories like that, sometimes they don't know if they're allowed to laugh. Mm. So I think, but um, that's the whole point, not the whole point, but one of the points mm -hmm. of the story um, that um, uh, uh, coming together and having humor and love as, uh, yeah, as a mm -hmm. perspective for the future. Um, I think that was something uh, German audiences reacted mm -hmm. to in a very good way also, and Israeli audiences mm -hmm. uh, during the film fest. We don't have a release yet, like an official a distribution in Israel, but we screened well, it at a film yeah. festival online. So yeah, we, we got mm -hmm. very good feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I think I told you my parents are Holocaust survivors and I could really uh, relate to the difficulty of accepting someone with a German background into the family. And I really liked the way you navigated all of that with all of that with humor, because as I said, my parents realized they were being slightly irrational, but they couldn't stop it. And, um, you know, I, I thought that was really forceful, the way that you were able to navigate the nuances of the situation, you know, it wasn't all black and white. And thank you even though that. characters had a struggle with how they felt, you got that as well as the overall principle of how we accept diversity. So I, you know, I like that there were the three specific examples. So it wasn't stereotyping for just one sort of relationship. And was that all in the, in the original script, the three different couples? Yes. Yes, and I'm not revealing um, a big secret here. Um, uh, it is um, in parts also um, autobiographical for Shirel. So elements, she took elements of, of her family background. Um, of course, it's not entirely um, a 100% reflection. It's not a documentary, but it has parts of, it is all very grounded in reality. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. So um, and I think that came through in the family, in the film, you know, just the variety of different reactions. So again, it wasn't stereotyped in any way. It really seemed to come from the heart. Yeah, it, it, it was very, it was also because when we, when we started to pitch it, people were like, oh, come on, you just put everything together. It's like, it's like this, this special menu and you have the Arab and you have, you have Shoah mm -hmm. and you have the lesbians. Yeah, yeah, and right. so and we were like, but it's like that. This is our story and we have enough reason to tell it like that. So um, sometimes mm -hmm. truth is stranger mm -hmm. than fiction. Um, anything else you wanna add, Christine? Well, I mean, I just, uh, I just hope that um, uh, in, a, in a very polarized world, um, uh, our little film can contribute something to um, 
yeah, to create dialogue with with humor and and with love and um, uh, yeah, that we maybe even though we're we're we might not be sharing um, history backgrounds or current day opinions, if um, we can have conflict in love like these families have, then that would be a big step forward. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for giving that addition, uh, giving us that additional insight into the film. I know it uh, meant a lot to me, and I will look forward to continuing to discuss the film now that you know you've given us a little bit of the backstory. So it's just wonderful to have you here, and we look forward to your next adventure and your next film. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye bye now. Bye. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. And before we get to the questions, I would just like to ask Yaniv how you respond to the use of humor to broach this very difficult subject and what other techniques you use at Divat Haviva to get people to talk to each other? Well, um, two stories. First one connected to the Shoah. So my kibbutz, the, the pioneers in my kibbutz, uh, half of them came from Poland and half of them came from the United States, actually. They are part of Hashomer Atzeir, which is the first Zionist youth movement, and it is also known to be the most leftist youth movement. But just like when the kibbutz was 10, then it, it brought a big group of Holocaust survivors. And I grew up with those uh, survivors in the kibbutz. And some of them, although they were many years older than me, became very good friends of mine. Uh, and they used a lot of black and sarcastic humor, humor about the Shoah. Um, again and again, jokes, really hard jokes. And for me, it was like, okay, part of the way to deal with the Shoah some really sarcastic jokes about it. And in one of my first trips to Germany as the CEO of Givat Chaviva, I had a meeting with the friends of Givat Chaviva in Germany. And, and, and the Germans, they like to drink beer. And after several beers, we were speaking about the, um, the things that they'll do to support Givat Chaviva during the next year. And after like 10 minutes, I brought a really sarcastic Shoah uh, joke um, in, in that room. Uh, and all of a sudden, all the laughter stopped. They became really serious. And they said, well, here's one lesson that you, you should know. With us in Germany, you do not make any jokes of the Shoah. We, for us, there's, there's no humor connected to this. So you use your humor everywhere, but not in Germany regarding this. It, it was an important, uh, um, I think, lesson for me about the different ways that both societies are dealing with the, with the Holocaust. Uh, the, the, the almost sacred way that many of the Germans, and you could even see it in the movie, are, are, are treating the Holocaust, uh, what they're willing to speak or not willing to speak. And from our and as, as, as the victims, um, at least I grew up in a lot of uh, cynical, humoristic uh, approach to the Shoah. Second thing is about um, the, the director or producer here, she spoke about the movie in terms of creating dialogue. It's, it's a phrase that she just used. Um, so, when I entered Givat Chaviva eight and a half years ago, I, I was uh, trying to evaluate all the, all the programs. And I, I found an evaluation of the Givat Chaviva Dialogue Programs for Youth that uh, did a leading professor in the field that he showed that he thought that uh, there was too much confrontation in those dialogue sessions. And in order to show me how, uh, how bad it is, he showed me some quotes of mostly Jewish teenagers that they said prior, we always hated Arabs. 
But prior to the Givat Chaviva dialogue, we never knew why we hated them. Now, after the dialogue, we understood why we hated the Arabs. Um, and I said, this is awful. I mean, uh, because in Israel, 90% of the kids will go K through 12 without even having one opportunity for an encounter with an Arab or an Arab with a Jew, which is, which is really awful. And finally, when they meet, uh, if this is what happens, this is very negative. So we changed the curriculum and we brought in a lot of humor into the, the meetings. And, and since then, when I'm entering those encounters, I see a lot of smiling faces and people that connect. And it's not that the problems are just thrown aside and we just put our heads into the sand and we don't like to, to look at it, but it's connecting people through their shared ability as human beings and, and their ways to laugh at things and connected what teens connect creates a better platform for us to reach also the more difficult nuances of living together in this country between Jews and Arabs. So humor is definitely a tool that we use. And that was so interesting. Can you just give us one more story about one of the successful changes that you made to the curriculum to better get people to talk to each other? Um, okay. Um, here's another story about uh, something that we did actually in 2014. In 2014, we evaluated a huge problem that the young Arab generation does not speak Hebrew at all. I mean, their parents are speaking Hebrew and they get four hours a day, a, a week of learning Hebrew. They can um, understand or read the Bible, read some Hebrew uh, literature, and they cannot speak. They cannot use the language. Uh, and we came to the Ministry of Education and we said, listen, you have to change the curriculum and bring at least two hours a week uh, to a different way of teaching Hebrew by teaching spoken Hebrew. Put aside the reading and writing, just let them have an ability to run a conversation. And the reply was, amazing said uh, the, the ministry of education said listen we have no curriculum for that and also uh and, and what we said the way we suggest to do it is bring jewish teachers that hebrew is their mother tongue to teach the spoken hebrew in arabic uh, schools and it's 2014 it's only six and a half years ago and they said listen we have no curriculum but we also don't even have one Jewish teacher that is teaching in an Arab school. Now, we have a segregated educational system here in Israel, actually into four different systems. There's one Arab education system and three different Jewish educational systems. One, just general public. The second one is um, general public orthodox, and the third one is for the Karadim, for the ultra orthodox, and those three do not connect. And in the Arab uh, schools, no Jewish teacher just goes into an Arab village and teaches by himself. So we said to the Ministry of Education, okay, give us some hours that you pay for their salaries, and we will bring teachers and we will create a curriculum and and that's the way we'll start teaching spoken Hebrew. And the answer was, they, they laughed at me and they said, you must be crazy. This country has been running for so many years. You won't find Jewish teachers that will come in to teach in an Arab uh, uh, village. Uh, so it's just a bad idea. And, and I said, okay, just give me, give me a chance. Promise me that you give me hours uh, salaries for 10 teachers 
that I will bring into uh, into Arab schools for a pilot plan. And by June of 2014, I was granted those hours. And right afterwards, the war in Gaza started. So it was now a terrible war, which was for more than two months, uh, that brought a lot of hatred and fear into Israel between Jews and Arabs in Israel. And I've got those hours from the ministry, but who will come and teach? So I went out mostly to the kibbutznik fellows like me, uh, and I said, listen, I need people to come from ideological background, not because you're looking now for a spot to teach, but because you understand that this is what this country needs. And, and finally, we found those 10 people. And, and now we are, after six years uh, of running the program, we're now in the seventh year. It's a nationwide program. It runs in more than 100 schools. We've got 25,000 students that are studying Hebrew in a different way. And we get great relationships now between the teachers, those Jewish teachers who are now over 100 teachers teaching in Arab schools that have created great relations with their Arab peers. And we've got young Arab generation that speaks different Arabic, uh, different Hebrew, but they're also seeing the Jewish teachers as a role model for them. So I think that's a very good story about part of what we're doing and an ability of an NGO to change governmental uh, strategies. Yeah, absolutely. That was fascinating. Um, I do want to remind you that you can write your questions in the chat. And that is sort of in the middle of the bottom of your screen. If you just click on the button that says chat, you can write your question in there. Or if you go to reactions, you can raise your hand and we can call on you that way. So we do want your responses, not only to what Yaniv is saying, but what you think about the movie. Christine's not on the call anymore. Did you like it? Didn't you like it? Did you think that the message was successful? maybe one couple other than another. So, you know, we, we also want to talk to the, about the movie as well as hear more about what Yaniv has to say. So I'm going to call on uh, Ava Kleinman to ask her question, Ava, and just make sure you unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, hi Yaniv. I thought the movie was charming. It was charming. It had many layers. And I thought it was very, very sweet. What we just heard, I thought it was interesting what Christine Gunther said, and I don't know if you can address it, but she said that the movie doesn't present the gay couple as being a central issue to the movie. So I was thinking about that, and how would the movie then have been different if it was a straight couple? Would we have had, would it have been less humorous or would there have been, would we have lost, what would we have lost if we, if it was a straight couple? Thank you. Um, thank you. So actually it's a discussion I had with my wife. Uh, we watched the movie together. My wife is an educational consultant and she is uh, working in a Jewish Arab school. One of the only six bilingual by national school. And she said that she thought that the gay couple are the center of the movie. And I said that they're not. They're, they're used in order to frame other issues, but they're not. And, and she said, you know, it doesn't matter what the movie producers and directors meant because this is a very key issue here in Israel. Um, the, uh, the ability of gay couples to, to live here and to create families. Uh, furthermore, uh, the disability of Arab gay couples, of Arab gay people to be part of the Arab society. Uh, and, and there was, of course, nothing here about Arab gay people, but, but it is a huge issue. Actually, one of the biggest issues in, in the political split that happened in the Arab United uh, Political Party um, that had decided to, to
to disunite, to, to, to split into this election uh, after two votes that uh, the Islamist part in this uh, joint party uh, was not uh, willing to contain the uh, more humanistic leftist part that support for uh, for gay people in the Arab society. Um, so, in terms of the issue, uh, it's a big issue in Israel. Um, how uh, gay marriage, uh, gay families, uh, still people are not able to bring children into a gay family in Israel. Uh, and there is no gay marriage in Israel. So all those are, are pretty big issues. But in the movie, I think that this couple could be just a German and Jewish couple, and it would still serve what the movie wanted to, stay, to, to say about the relationships between third generation of Jews and Arabs, or and Jews and, and Germans, uh, third generation of a German Nazi, and the third generation of Jewish Holocaust, they don't need to be gay. They just need to be people that are in love, trying to form a new life in a new world and put away the history and the background in order for that not to interfere with their ability to just become people that love each other. Thank you. And next, I'm going to go to Richard Friedman. Richard, can you unmute yourself? Richard? Uh, Richard, I don't know what happened to him, so I'm going to ask his question. Oh, <laughs> this is my husband actually in the next room, so there seems to be a little technical difficulty here. But he wanted to know how different the movie would be if it was from a from a Palestinian or Arab perspective. Well, there was an Arab perspective in the movie, um, and actually an important one. Uh, although it was, it, it might, I mean, I'm very sensitive to that. So uh, the use of the Nakba, and it's an opportunity for me to speak about the Nakba a bit, uh, was in the movie. Uh, the grandmother, the Holocaust uh, survivor, uh, actually the movie, I think, was filmed, her house was in, uh, I would assume, in Enkarim, uh, in Jerusalem. And Enkarim was an Arab Palestinian village uh, part of, uh, uh, prior to 48. And now it's, it's a very prestigious Jerusalem neighborhood. Uh, people there living in Arab homes. Uh, she was living in an Arab home uh, that was not bombed, was not taken down. Uh, it was as is an Arab home of someone who'd left it and she's living in there. And her neighbor was an Arab that made it uh, in society as a doctor, uh, could live in part of Israel, and he was living in another home. And uh, those things happened in Israel. Uh, we've got in Haifa, and in Jaffa, and in Jerusalem. Um, those are shared cities or mixed cities uh, where Arabs and Jews are living together. But the notion of the Nakba, um, just some facts. Uh, prior to the, to the Nakba, there were about more than 600 villages that were totally erased uh, in 48. And I told you about the story of my kibbutz. My kibbutz was the first kibbutz, the first Jewish, Jewish settlement in what is known today as the Menashe Hills. It's pretty much in, in like the, the northern center of Israel, close to a city uh, called the uh, Yoknam, just above the Jezreel Valley. Uh, but when Anna Shofet came there, there was not even one Jewish settlement and there were seven right next to us villages and another five in the region, which makes it 12 
Palestinian villages. Currently in our regional um, municipality, there are 12 um, settlements, 12 kibbutzim and moshavim, uh, just the same amount of villages that were prior to 48. Now they're all erased, totally erased. And that's the Nakba. The Nakba is a catastrophe. That's the meaning of the word of, of people that had lost their home. So from the Palestinian perspective, uh, I would say that they, if they, the movie was all about that, that would be a much bigger portion of the movie. And you'll get that perspective of Ibrahim probably in another second and third generations of Palestinians. Some of them in Israel, some of them outside of Israel, uh, looking to come back, maybe under occupied territories in the West Bank or Gaza, and maybe in Europe as fourth or fifth generation of refugees, or in a refugee camp in Syria or Lebanon, that's the Palestinian perspective. And still, this is an Israeli movie, and in a short glimpse, but there was a perspective of the Nakba. I think Craig Browdy has a follow-up question to that. Craig, don't forget to unmute yourself. I just wondered about how you felt about the ending of the movie and how that might be perceived from a Palestinian perspective. You mean in terms of the marriages? How would they view the actual getting together? No, the very end, when there was actually something fell off the table and say he said a bomb and he laid on the floor and everybody went crazy. I mean, that, that left me a little bit unsettled after the whole movie, you know, for that to be chosen, for that's the way they end it. Maybe that's the humor and maybe that's the, you know, sort of the, the peak, but, but I wondered what you thought of that. Well, it's, it's not only the humor. It's part of showing the... Uh, the Israeli fear, the deep fear of everything. One of the, speaking of laughter and humor, one of the things that my Arab partners uh, in Israel are saying uh, to me a lot is that the problem in Israel that we've got a very strong Jewish majority that acts like a scared minority, and we've got a very small Arab minority that feels like a powerful majority and they're not scared at all. So uh, in many ways, and I think this is, is connected to the Holocaust, the sense of victimhood and fear of the actual existence of Jewish people and connecting it to the wars and the tension of wars and the terror uh, puts people on, on, on the edge all the time. And that was the last scene. Uh, any any small noise uh, right away brings huge fear. Huge fear. I, 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 I speak of uh, my wife. My wife grew up in a kibbutz uh, right next to the Lebanese border, kibbutz Fasod, and uh, and katyushot and bombs were part of her childhood. And for years, any time that she would hear. A, a, a bomb and we, we have, you know, army drills around, she would, she would jump or she would be so, so tensed. Um, so, so people from so many different occasions, whether those are uh, army soldiers with, with post-trauma from wars or people that were around terrorist attacks uh, or people that lived uh, next to borders uh, so many people are so tensed, and this is part of uh, the Israeli society. Um, I can tell you about myself. As a soldier, I was in Lebanon. Um, I'm, I'm a paratrooper. Um, in situation of, 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 of a war, um, I was at least in three different locations of terrorist attacks that were close to me. Um, I had a son that was in the army uh, that I had three years of fear, uh, definitely in times of 
operations that were connected. Uh, so this is part of who we are, and this is part of why uh, people are so tense. And I, this is pretty much the way I viewed the last scene, reminding this connection of this uh, this approach, the on-edge approach of uh, Israelis. And uh, I think it's Richard Singer did put in the chat, if you didn't notice, that years ago there was a bombing at a wedding in Israel and how horrible that was. So I guess it's, you know, actually, unfortunately, related to an experience that happened there. Um, can I call on Larry Rosendorf to ask a question, please? Uh, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, excuse me. Yeah, you had mentioned, uh, I came in a little late and maybe you covered this already, but I know that marriages performed outside of Israel, for example, a reformed Jew that could be married, they would, wouldn't be married in Israel, but they would be married outside. Their marriage would be recognized in Israel. Um, what, are the same things true then of um, a marriage, for example, between two gay people or a Palestinian woman and a, an, an Israeli man? Well, one of the problems in Israel is that we don't, you know, the whole question of church and state or, or religion and state, uh, we don't have them splitted. They're, they're connected. So marriages might be from a legal point of view uh, recognized, but in terms of, of uh, some of the rights that you get, uh, you, you just won't be recognized. Uh, so gay marriages will not be recognized, recognized, and marriages between a Jew and a Palestinian will not be recognized in, in, in those ways. Uh, it is a problem. There is no uh, total recognition of secular marriages. People in Israel that cannot uh, be recognized by the religious Jewish marriage uh, go to Cyprus in order to get married in some um, in the municipality in one of the biggest uh, Cyprus uh, cities. Um, gay marriages are done uh, in like an informal way, uh, but they're not recognized, fully recognized. Just as a follow-up, Israel's got quite a complicated court system because of the way that some of the civil courts and uh, some of the religious courts are uh, right. split apart. For example, you even have a court of Sharia law. Right. Um, which basically takes care of uh, many civil things. So marriages performed in the Sharia law or in the Christian courts then are recognized by the state of Israel? Yeah, they are. Um, but it's a, Larry, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very correct point that you, you've made. I mean, we've got rabbinic law, we've got Sharia law, Christian law, and, and the civil law, and uh, and and it's it's uh, quite a mess uh, but but just an answer to your your question so yeah uh, marriages that are accepted by the sharia law um, as a muslim um, marriage is accepted by the country thank you thank you and next can we hear from david hirsch unmute yourself please if you're not already unmuted David Hirsch. Well, I'm going to David. go soon anyway at 755, so. Yes, David, you want to ask your question? Yeah. Okay, I got it. It's Gail Hirsch. Go ahead. Go, ahead. go talk to her. No, what I wanted to say was in the very last Hold on. Hold on. Gail. Uh, in the very Gail. last scene, it just meant to me that no matter what, that the gay couple was getting along, the German couple came to terms, the um, grandmother and the Arab doctor came to terms. Everybody was happy, except the truth was when he yelled bomb, they all started to fight because they really didn't care about, or they couldn't really be together, the Arabs and the Jews. That's how I, that's how I saw it. Anyone else want to? Have a opinion on the ending? We have just a couple more minutes. 
Any other comments on the, uh, Greg, did you want to say something? Yeah, I thought that it was uh, a little bit disappointing that it ended with fighting as opposed to ending with everyone sort of pointing a finger at him and saying, you know, how absurd it was, the fear, you know, that you talked about before, you know, the, the, it, it's uh, absurd is the wrong word, but disappointing perhaps that, 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 that there's still the fear, even in a wedding where people were getting together. Yes, but the fear is understandable given the history. So I guess that's a tough one. Uh, Yanif, do you have any final words from us? I, was there anyone else that wanted to ask a question? One more question? Uh, okay, Richard, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, for Yanif, you talked about the efforts you've made to teach Arab children Hebrew. What about teaching Israeli Jewish kids Arabic? I mean, you know, we're a small minority in a large area. There are much more, there are many more Arabs than Jews, and a lot of other countries surrounding them all speak Arabic. What would the benefits be to teaching the Israeli kids Arabic so they communicate with the Lebanese and Syrian and Jordanian and Egyptians and Palestinians? That would seem to be the corollary of what you said. It would seem to make a lot of sense. Is there any effort of going on for that? So I, I will need after answering this another minute or two, because I want to finish in an optimistic voice, and this one is pessimistic. Uh, and your question was a very good one. Um, and so it comes with another story. Uh, after four years of running this uh, spoken Hebrew program with Jewish teachers in Arab schools, we went again to the Ministry of Education and said, hey, Ministry of Education, now it's time to do the opposite. We will bring Arab teachers to teach spoken Arabic in Jewish middle schools. By the way, the, the program I didn't mention before that we're doing is in, in Arab middle schools. And, and the first answer was, but we have three hours of teaching Arabic in, in middle schools. And I said, well, you know, you're teaching them classic Arabic, Fusha which is just no one wants to uh, read and write. It's very difficult. And actually, most, uh, most schools don't teach it. So give us the opportunity to bring the teachers, and they will teach them the spoken language. And that will be much better. Um, and again, we, got, we, we, we get them convinced, and we got funding to create a curriculum and we got teachers and we trained the teachers and we were ready to bring this big program into the um, Jewish schools, uh, the Hebrew Jewish schools. And then uh, finally, just about a week before the program was supposed to start, the woman who's the, the chief inspector for Arabic studies in Jewish schools was able to put the plug on uh, and stop it because she just didn't want the spoken language to be taught. Um, and, and, and we were not able, it's been two years now, that we, we are not able to make this program run. And, and I have good connections with the ministry. Uh, and I said, how come? Why is it happening? And the answer was very disappointing. It said, you know, uh, we, we understand that Givat Chaviva wants good relations between Jews and Arabs, but that's not the reason why we support the spoken Hebrew. Um, we support uh, the spoken Hebrew program because we understand that the Israeli economy needs a much better connection for the future Arab citizens uh, to uh, the uh, uh, Jewish mainstream um, and we need them to be part of our economy. So they need to speak Hebrew. Um, but we don't really need Jewish people to speak Arabic. How would that contribute to the future of Israel? We, and even someone told me, we need them to know the Arabic that we need uh, for the army in order to combat what we need to combat. But not the kind of Arabic that you want to give them in order to connect between people. And that's a big shame for, for our country. 
and definitely you're pointing the finger and a well needed uh, change. Uh, we, the Jews, need to speak the language of the minority in Israel, and we need to speak the language of the majority of our neighbors in the Middle East. And now there is a talk about the Abraham Accords and, and, and the new possibilities of connections with Arabs in the region. We can't come there as people that are neglected to the language. Uh, so we in Givat Khaviva would continue to, to, to make the good fight until we're able to teach Arabic also. We do have an Arabic language institution in Givat Khaviva that has been running for 53 years. And it's part of what we do. Uh, and it's the best program for teaching Arabic in Israel. Uh, but that is a program for people that are investing several months and are coming as adults to learn the language. Um, if our time is over, then I, I want to add like a minute or two of the general statements. And it still is also connected to the movie because there is one American figure in the movie, and that is the, uh, the settler who is in charge of this right-wing politics. Um, uh, that, uh, that he is uh, taking his family to the West Bank um, and he's like the only uh, one who is, uh, who is bringing the, the voice, I think, of the, the American uh, Jewish uh, community into this uh, film. And from my approach, and this is part of, uh, of the things that I didn't say about myself, but I've been twice a shaliach of the Jewish agency uh, to the community, uh, the Jewish community in North America. And the reason that, that was important for me is that I think that the only way for Jewish con continuity would be if we are connected. Uh, for the Jewish community, uh, when you look at Jewish people today, um, in Israel, there is something a bit more than 40% of Jewish people uh, in Israel, around 43, 44%. In North America, just a bit less than 40%. And the rest is all over the world. So most of the Jewish people are between North America and Israel. For Jewish continuity in the United States and Canada, there is a necessity to be connected to Israel. And from the cultural perspective, from the language perspective, from the educational perspective, there's a true necessity of connection. But I think it goes both ways. It also goes from the Israeli perspective. For us, there is a huge necessity to see how Jewish pluralism acts. We don't have pluralistic approach to Judaism, which is a big reason why young generations that are secular, uh, it's either be orthodox or secular, don't feel that Judaism is too important for them. So the connection between us is pivotal. And it's not only pivotal in terms of Jewish continuity, it's also pivotal of having kind of ownership of, for Israel. It's my home, it's also your home, although you're not living there, but it is the home of the Jewish people. And this home is in, in danger in terms of the approach to democracy. And you come from a democratic country with a, a very, I think, or, or more solid democratic approach. And part of the reason that I'm awake in, what is it now, 3.05 a.m. in a discussion with you, because I think this discussion is pivotal to our future, to the future of Judaism and to the future of Israel as a democratic state. And I'm finishing my words with this sense of partnership and a request for you, be partners. Feel that Israel is a state that you have part of the ownership for and part of what will ensure Israel democracy in the future and our ability to be both a home 
for a national home for the Jewish people, but a democratic egalitarian home for all citizens will be much more successful if you are part of the discussion. So please be, and thank you for hosting me tonight. Thank you so much to Yaniv for all of those lessons which he imparted to us as well as the uh, insight into the movie and it was just a wonderful addition to a wonderful movie. Thank you so much to everybody for coming tonight. Our next discussion will be Here We Are. The movie is now available for streaming and the discussion will be this Wednesday at 7 p.m. We look forward to seeing you. If you haven't got that link yet, again, feel free to uh, email either Sunny or me. And I did put the address again the, of Gibat Habiba to find out more about that institution. And Yaviv Tador Abba, Laila Tov. And we hope to see you in Israel. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Good night. Bye-bye.